Hello, my name's Scott Berry. I'm a biostatistician with Berry Consultants, and I'm gonna to talk to you about a topic that's misunderstood, I think. Uh, it's designing clinical trials using simulation, or we refer to it as in silico clinical trial design. The term simulation in many ways is misunderstood. It's used ubiquitously in the media. You'll hear this word, and I think there's a distrust of simulations. And a lot of times it's because it's brought out in the way of, I'm predicting something that we'll never get to actually learn about, or it's something in the future. And the general public has unease about predictions. So here's typical things you'll see about simulations. Here on your, on your left side, you'll see a prediction of what would happen if Muhammad Ali fought Rocky Marciano. They fought at very different eras. This fight will never happen, but somebody put together a simulation of that. And this brings about, I think, a little bit of distrust in what a simulation is. That, oh, a computer did this in some way. At the same time, notice what the purpose of this was, was to predict what would happen if the two of them fought in a bo boxing match. Uh, on your right, you'll see a prediction uh, from Madden simulation of NFL 25, where they're predicting who will win the Super Bowl. Uh, they show a, a Viking Packer game where they're running through the prediction. Again, this simulation's purpose is about predicting what will happen. We're, many of us are familiar with predictions of weather, whether we think it's done well or poorly. The role of, of, of computer simulation and weather is about predicting it. Here's an instance where they're trying to predict the progress of a hurricane. What time and location will it hit the U.S. border? Uh, and, and this is really what it's about is prediction. When we're talking about clinical trial simulations, we're thinking about something else. What are we thinking about? So we're inundated with simulations being about predictions. In clinical trial scenarios, there's a lot of people who talk about, a lot of scientists who talk about simulations in the role. They're trying to predict what happens when you put the drug in the body. We use it in a very different way, and I mean we as in clinical trial designers. We can do prediction, but it's really not what we're doing in in silico design. So think about another way in which simulations are used, the building of airplanes. They run simulations to look at what will be the, the airflow in the airplane, what will be the lift, the miles per hour, how much fuel it will use, the stress on the airplane. Here's a couple predictions of uh, simulated airplane design. What do they use these for? They're not necessarily predicting failure rates of airplanes. They're trying to build a better airplane. Then we change the design, we change the shape of the nose, we put a bigger engine on it, the wings have flips on the end, and we look what will be the airflow, what will be the impact of that. Oh, we built a better airplane. Uh, we change a number of aspects, and this iterates through and that the airplane is built on a computer. They eventually build the actual airplane and then they test it in that way, but the role of simulation for them is to build a better airplane. And that's the role of simulation for us in building a clinical trial. We want to build a better design, not necessarily predict the design. So the, we, we can simulate the behavior of a design, just like you simulate airflow on an airplane, we simulate what happens if the drug doesn't work, what happens if the drug is a, small, a very strong effect, how well does this design pick it up, how much resources do we need to find that. In a way, simulation for us is nothing more than complex mathematical calculation. It is numerical integration. We refer to it as simulation, which sometimes gives a little bit of distrust that we have distrust in what simulation is. Thinking back to Muhammad Ali against Rocky Marciano. But really, it's glorified mathematical complex integration here in that setting. So really, we use it 
uh, in, in a fixed trial, in a standard classical trial that you're used to, it has non-moving parts, it has fixed sample size, two or three arms, a straightforward final analysis. We can do those mathematical calculations on pencil and paper. We don't need to simulate those to understand power, the number of subjects used, the likelihood of a type 1 error, all of these things we can do on pencil and paper. As soon as the design gets complicated, like the design of an airplane, we need much more sophisticated mathematical tools, and computer simulation is our tool to do that. Here is an example of a standard adaptive trial. You enroll patients, you collect an initial set of data uh, during the burn-in period of time. A mathematical model does some analysis on that data. You might stop the trial, drop arms. You have adaptive decision rules. The trial may stop or the trial may continue and you allocate patients differently. Different randomization, adding arms, dropping arms, enrolling different kinds of patients in the trial. So you've got your, your sequence of analyzing data, stopping rules, decision rules, how we allocate patients, then we enroll more patients, we collect more data. And this process continues and just evolves as a complicated trial. We can't take pencil and paper, we can't solve how well this works without more sophisticated mathematical tools. So how do we do this? We take that trial and we create software that can simulate that trial exactly. It simulates the mathematical analysis being done. It simulates the adaptive decision rules being done. It simulates the uh, enrollment of patients. It simulates the time lag. It's a real-time creation of the design. We then take that design that we now have a, a software of, and we create different virtual subject scenarios. We want to test the design. We want to give it different air flows uh, and give it different conditions to see how it reacts, just like we're building an airplane. So we give it a scenario where the drugs don't work, where the drugs are harmful, where they're very effective, where one dose is much more effective than others, and we test it. We stick it into the software and we see what happens. There are several other aspects of this that are quite important in the simulation. Accrual rate is critical to an adaptive trial. The dropout rate. These aspects, we need to pair virtual subjects with the assumptions of what's going to happen in the real time. Those are the inputs to the simulation. Then we carry out the, the, the software, the mathematical integration is really carrying out individual trials. We then investigate individual trials. How well did that individual trial work? We can pick up that, wow, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on this part of the design. We're asking it to do too much too early. Much like looking at an airplane and saying there's way too much pressure on this part of the plane, there's a risk of collapse because of that. We could do exactly the same thing in a clinical trial. We then simulate thousands of trials like this, millions of trials, and we can investigate how well did it do. Now we know the right answer, we know the virtual subjects, we know the truth, and then we see what the trial thinks at the end of the day. That allows us to vary sample size, to the number of doses, uh, how frequently we look at the data, what data, what the model is, and we can iterate this and build a better design through this process. The same way you build a better airplane, you build a better automobile through this mathematical simulation. So we use it for exploration, for design, not for prediction. We get a great deal of scenarios to test the sensitivity of the design under extreme conditions, under favorable conditions, how well does the design work? We're not interested in prediction per se, we're interested in a better design. So here's an example trial where we did the, exactly this process. 
the trial started, and if it had to be done on pencil and paper, uh, it would have been done in this very simple format. This is the treatment of su subjects who have suffered a cardiac arrest. They're brought to the hospital, they've been resuscitated, and now there's a worry of a cascading set of, of negative events that are brought on by heat in the body. It's thought that cooling them, uh, uh, hypothermia, is, a, is, a, is something that's going to give them better neurological status afterwards. So they wanted to run a trial. The first pencil and paper shot at this was putting 12 hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours as the arms or durations in the trial. Fix sample size. We can do this on pencil and paper. So what we do now in mathematical simulation of this in silico design is we simulate that trial. We create multiple scenarios, and you'll see on the left a simulation of that very straightforward design. We then ask, how well does this work? It doesn't work really well, and under some scenarios, we're left in a gray area. We don't know the right answer. How could we do this better? Here's a pressure point. So we then say, well, we should maybe have more durations. Add a dose response model or a duration response model to this. Allocate patients because we now have 12 durations there we need to do response adaptive randomization. So we iterate the design, we explore how well this works. Here's an example where we showed this to the clinical team and they didn't like the duration response model. They thought it was essentially not biologically plausible that the model could, the, the, the actual truth could go up level off, come down, and go back up again. It's just not biologically feasible, so they wanted to iterate the design. So we continued in silico computer simulation. We eventually added where we changed the model. We added response adaptive randomization. We opened it up to two different patient populations, two rhythm types. Uh, uh, under this situation. We were able to stress the design, do more, because we stressed it through this mathematical integration. The trial ended up, it, it, through all of these iterations, with 10 durations rather than three, response adaptive randomization to treat patients better, to learn better, and we learned in the simulation that this happens. We added two patient populations as opposed to just one, the final analysis changed and the sample size was the same as the fixed trial. So through this stressing of the design, we were able to create a better design. Diabetes uh, phase 2-3 seamless trial is another example. This trial started with three doses, uh, treatment for three months for subjects. We were able through, through simulation to turn it from a phase two trial to a two, three design with seven doses instead of three, a placebo and an active control. We do interim analyses every two weeks during the trial, response adaptive randomization to the doses that were performing better. We, we, we define better using a utility function. As we stress this in the simulations, it became clear there were four critical outcomes that needed to be looked at. Just like in an airplane, we look at what happens to the stress on the plane. These are the four critical factors that came out of this. We had rules that would decide when it moves to a phase three part. It could pick one or two doses in phase three. The trial could stop for futility if things were not going well. Uh, what happened in the actual trial, it ran at 200 patients the earliest time possible. It shifted to phase three. The drug was very, very successful. The trial actually ran exactly as it was simulated. This is one of the critical aspects of this. Through the vetting, through the simulation, when it actually ran, it ran perfectly. The DSMB was involved, but the trial ran exactly as it was supposed to. When it was done, it spawned future phase three trials. So what happened? What was the outcome of this? This was a Lilly trial. Here is a, a news article from Fierce Biotech in September 
of 2014 that talks about the FDA approving uh, dulaglutide for diabetes. This was the drug that was used in that seamless phase 2-3 trial that was built entirely by simulation. One of the projections was that this drug will take in $1.3 billion a year by 2020. The trial design sped this process up perhaps 12 to 18 months. Maybe it got a dose that would never have been explored had we been stuck with pencil and paper. But through clinical trial simulation, we built a better mousetrap. We built a better design to get the right answers. GNE myopathy, a very rare disease, uh, the subjects progress over 20 or 25 years. Uh, on the order of five in a million patients have GNE myopathy. What we want to do, rather than compare to historical data to randomize patients to a placebo, is we built a disease progression model. Subjects will be allocated entirely to a treatment, and they'll be compared to a disease progression model. This is a complicated trial. The, the disease progression model is complicated. You see what the, the expectation for strength in various muscles in the body is over the course of time. How does a trial like this behave? How many patients do we need? How long do we need to follow patients? What's type one error? You can't do this on paper, but we can build this complicated trial in software in silico to create a much more effective trial design. So these are three example trials that you can't build on pencil and paper. So in summary, through the history of clinical trial development, design so far, we've had to be able to go to pencil and paper, calculate the analytical characteristics of our trial design. It limits us to box shapes. It limits us in what kind of designs we can use. Complicated designs, the mathematics is too hard. We now have techniques to do those calculations. We do numerical integration, very straightforward clinical trial simulation to calculate those operating characteristics. We can do the calculations now. That allows us to create much more effective designs, treat patients better, do better science, Really, designs now, are, our imagination is the only limitation to what kind of clinical trial designs we have. It's not the ability to do the mathematical calculations. The clinical trial simulation is really changing the landscape of the clinical design industry. And I showed you three examples of that here. So good luck, start simulating your trials. Thank you.